Well, I think we'll get started. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Welcome to our Samantha Smith Day celebration and road dedication ceremony. My name's Don Kimball, and on behalf of Chapter One of Maine Veterans for Peace, we're so very glad that you could join us here today to remember Samantha's life and her legacy. It's my distinct pleasure and honor to serve as your Master of Ceremonies today. This day has been a long time coming. I've probably been planning for over a year to make this all happen. Well, the last couple of days were kind of frantic, and some of the volunteers that were helping said to me, uh, Don, uh, what's going on with you? Uh, it looks like you may have PTSD. And I'm like, PTSD? And they said, yes, pre-traumatic Samantha Day. <laughs> uh, but that's all over with now. Uh, the worst is over, and the best is yet to come. We've got a great lineup of speakers and entertainment. Uh, we're so very glad that uh, you could be here today. And we're hoping that the sun comes out when we do the road dedication, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's all good. And once again, I'll just remind everybody, if you could please make sure uh, that your phones are muted. Uh, before we begin with the speakers and everything, I'd like to read a land acknowledgement and some thank yous. We pay our respects today to the descendants, both past and present, of the Wabanaki Confederacy. The original inhabitants of this land we stand upon, we recognize their 13,000 year ancestral history here in what we now call Maine. Let us consider our own place in the story of colonialism and commit to dismantling the legacy of displacement we have wrought. Next, I'd like to read a letter from Governor Janet Mills, who Unfortunately, couldn't be here today, but she did send a letter, and I'm going to uh, briefly read that. Dated May 31st. Dear friends, thank you for inviting me to this Samantha Smith Day dedication ceremony. I'm so sorry to miss this ceremony with the main chapter of Veterans for Peace. Samantha Smith, a Maine native, looked upon the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union with the innocence of a 10-year-old child. Through a letter to Soviet Premier Yuri Andropov, she expressed her fears of the possible threat of nuclear holocaust. After receiving the letter, Premier Andropov invited Samantha to visit the Soviet Union. There she learned that its citizens, especially its children, were very similar to those in Maine. As one of our country's youngest ambassadors for peace, she helped ease tensions between the two countries, opening the door to greater understanding and friendship among nations of the world. On behalf of the citizens of Maine, it brings me great pride to see the unveiling of the Samantha Smith Way here in South Portland. This ceremony is proof that her bravery and goodwill lives on in all of us who strive for peace. Thank you. Signed, Janet T. Mills, Governor, State of Maine. Next, we would like Eric Herter, who's a Vietnam veteran, a member of Veterans for Peace, to come forward, Eric, and read a letter from Lena Nelson, whose book was just published called Samantha Smith, America's Youngest Ambassador. Eric? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm carrying a copy of the book, and I've read it, and I highly recommend it. And there's a pile of them over there if anybody would like to pick one up. Um, what I was stunned by, I cried throughout reading this book just at this young woman's bravery and her brilliance at being able to face a battery of microphones by herself and have people shouting questions at her and to come back with beautiful, clear, cogent answers. It's a very worthwhile book reading. Also, the amount of press that she got, the newspapers and the TV stations were nothing but Samantha Smith for weeks, both in Russia and the United States and everywhere. She had an effect, and the final end of the Cold War, I think, she had an effect on it. And 
I would like to urge people to take a handful of the flyer that's on your table and send one of them to President Biden and one of them to Putin and one of them to your nephew or niece who is 12 years old and would be inspired by seeing what a 12-year-old can do. It's unbelievable what she did. Uh, here's, here's the book, and here's the letter from Lena, who is a Russian, who is about five years younger than Samantha, and was, like many people in Russia, smitten by Samantha collected a giant scrapbook of everything she could find about Samantha and ended up writing a book. Um, ended up moving to America, and so her name is Nelson, and it doesn't sound too Russian, but um, it's a brilliant book. And here's what she said. I first saw Samantha Smith on my black and white TV in my hometown in Archangel, Russia, in the spring of 1983. She was the first American I'd ever seen. Back then, to a Soviet child, the word American meant only one thing, the enemy. And yet, when I saw Samantha's cheerful smile, I knew there was something wrong with that message. Her question about whether the Soviets wanted to start a nuclear war got people on both sides of the Iron Curtain listening and then talking, quite possibly bringing us all back from the brink of war. During her two-week tour of the Soviet Union in the summer of 1983, Samantha shattered the image of Americans being the enemy. Her trip gave hope to me and many of my fellow Soviets. If there was one normal American family, chances were there were others. Today, the doomsday clock is at 90 seconds to midnight, the closest to global catastrophe it has ever been, says the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Forty years ago, 11-year-old Samantha Smith showed us that we could get along if we took the time to get to know each other. My sincere hope is that today we remember her message of peace. Tears being shed already here, so you have to excuse me for that. Anyway, I said I was going to do thank yous, and I, I forgot the thank yous, so let me not forget the thank yous and do the, do the thank yous now for everybody that's made this day uh, possible. The list is long. First of all, I'd like to thank Senator Carney, who will be speaking next, uh, for taking the bill and getting it through the main legislature. No easy task, and I believe uh, it went through all the committees uh, unanimously un unopposed and the, and the governor signed it uh, for the funds to build uh, the signs for Samantha Smith Way. So thank you, Senator Carney, for taking this ball and, and, and running with it. I think I first came to her with this idea uh, over a year ago. You may, have a, you may have a better idea of when it happened. Uh, also, the main Department of Transportation, who have uh, put up the signs out there, and we'll meet uh, Caleb, I think, who's going to help us do the unveiling. All the members of Veterans for Peace Chapter 1 and the Samantha Smith Chapter also, which are here, and, and they, they brought their banner. Uh, there's, a, there's a bust of, of uh, Samantha also uh, you should, should look at. Uh, thanks to all the VFP members who helped put this together, and also Peace Action Maine, who is video streaming, YouTubing, whatever that is uh, today. <laughs> uh, the Best Western. Mary Mannerian for donating this uh, facility for today. Uh, Governor Mills, of course. Uh, our caterers, Union Bagel and Holy Donuts, uh, there in the back. And finally, the South, po South Portland Police Department, who will uh, eventually, uh, towards the end of the, the festivities today, lead us safely across Route 1 over to where the sign will be unveiled. All right, and that was Eric Herter. Eric, thank you so much for reading Lena Nelson's letter. Uh, the book is for sale. Uh, Gary Lawless, uh, who will be speaking later on, is over there uh, at the table with, uh, with the book. So make sure you 
check that out. I'd like to bring up next uh, State Senator Ann Carney, who again was the driving force behind the legislation and uh, helping to make this day happen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I just have to give a huge thank you to Don Kimball and the Veterans for Peace um, for asking me to sponsor the legislation. I feel like the work that all of you did um, to support the bill pales in comparison to just, I mean, is, is so much more significant than the act of sponsoring the bill, um, and it's been a joy to work with you. I'm pleased to be here today with all of you to celebrate the legacy and memory of an extraordinary Mainer, Samantha Smith. Um, again, thanks to Don Kimball and to all of the members of Veterans for Peace who've worked so hard to turn the idea of Samantha Smith Way into a reality. We'd like to thank them also for organizing today's amazing event. This is truly a wonderful and special occasion. Um, it's rare that people gather together to celebrate peace, and that is what we're doing today. Um, today, as we recognize the enduring legacy of Samantha Smith, who was a young Goodwill ambassador and peace activist, uh, she was a peace activist during a time of great tension between the U.S. and the USSR. I'll tell you a little bit about her, although I'm sure you probably know most of this. Um, in the fall of 1982, 10-year-old Samantha was a fifth grader at Manchester Elementary School near Augusta. She read a Time Magazine story about the Soviet leader Yuri Andropov and the threat of nuclear war. She asked her mother, if people are so afraid of him, why doesn't someone write a letter asking whether he wants to have war or not? And her mother replied, why don't you? and Samantha took up the cause. Her letter is short and poignant, and I would like to read it to all of you. Dear Mr. Andropov, my name is Samantha Smith. I am a 10-year-old. Congratulations on your new job. I have been worrying about Russia and the United States getting into a nuclear war. Are you going to vote to have war or not? If you aren't, please tell me how you're going to help to not have a war. This question you do not have to answer, but I would like it if you would. Why do you want to conquer the world, or at least our country? God made the world for all of us to share and take care of, not to fight over, or to have one group of people own it all. Please, let's do what he wanted and have everyone be happy too. Samantha Smith. So she wrote this letter and um, Yuri Andropov did not respond to her. Um, and so she was a little indignant at that, and so she wrote to the Soviet ambassador to the United States. His name was Anatoly Dobrynin, and, and she asked the ambassador if Yuri Andropov intended to respond. And so due to this persistence, Samantha did receive a reply. She and her family were invited to visit the Soviet Union in the summer of 1983 as the guests of the Soviet leader. She and her parents spent two weeks traveling in the Soviet Union, getting to know children and adults in many part of that country. Samantha's kind, direct, and inquisitive nature, contagious optimism, and, and really genuine interest in learning about others created a bond between everyday people in the two nations. She also inspired many to believe that war between the superpowers, the two superpowers, could be averted. Um, through her bold action, Samantha also inspired Maine children and adults um, then and today to speak up on issues of importance in our lives. And, and I think this is a really important part of her story. To be persistent and insistent about bringing about a more peaceful world. And I'm sorry to tear up, but I've been, ever since um, Eric read the letter, I've been wanting to cry. <laughs> Excuse me. Tragically, she died just two years later in a plane accident. A memorial statue of Samantha Smith stands just outside of the Maine State Museum in Augusta. And when Veterans for Peace came to the Transportation Committee 
to support the bill. As we were standing there providing our testimony, we were looking out across the, the pathway between the State House and the Main State Museum, and directly in our view was the beautiful statue of Samantha Smith. For me, that was a sign that this would come into being. Um, naming this well-traveled approach ramp after Samantha Smith helps us preserve the memory of this remarkable young Mainer. And I hope it will inspire great conversations on family road trips about the importance of speaking up for what you believe in and also believing that you can make the world a more peaceful place. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Senator Carney. We need more people in Augusta like her, wouldn't you agree? Yes. yes. Maybe the governorship is in your future. <laughs> Next, I'd like to bring up a student from Brunswick Junior High School who on Biography Day wrote about Samantha Smith. Cecilia Smith came to the Maine State Legislature and was at that hearing the very first hearing for the Samantha Smith Way, and she spoke to the state legislature about how important Samantha's life and legacy was to her. And I give you Cecilia. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. I first heard Samantha Smith's story when I was probably seven, after asking my mother how she and my father had chosen my name. She had just recently said Samantha had been her favorite option growing up. Why didn't you name me Samantha then, I asked. She said, you would have had the name Samantha Smith. Yes, I thought, I would have, but that doesn't answer my question. She explained that I had been named after my great-grandmother Cecilia instead, but that I should know the story of the Goodwill Ambassador who had, just, who had lived just a few towns over from 1972 to 1985. This year, in my social studies class, we were presented with a task. Find a person in American history who stood out to us, research and learn about their life and legacy, and then try to embody them for a day, during which we were to present to lower grades in the school. I looked into a couple of other women, Audrey Hepburn, Nellie Bly, etc., before deciding to learn about someone more local, someone who I had almost shared a name with. That person was Samantha Smith. My final speech started with the lines, me, my mother, and my Chesapeake Bay Retriever, sitting in our kitchen, listening to Michael Jackson, and trying to understand why our country might get blown up any second. After this, the presentation followed her through the 13 years she was able to live. These years included writing to Queen Elizabeth at age five, writing to the Soviet Premier Yuri Andropov at age 10, writing, visiting the Soviet Union to learn about and befriend Soviet children during the Cold War, spreading mess many messages of peace and hope through media appearances such as The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and Good Morning America writing and publishing an autobiography with the help of her father and playing with her dog, Kim. From the very beginning of my research, I found her story extremely interesting and very relatable, especially because of the war in Ukraine raising U.S. tension with Russia. All of the small connections that I could make, people I knew who had grown up in Maine and heard about her or even knew her as a child, this was what inspired me to continue my, with my knowledge of her story. When I found out that there had been a bill proposed to the Maine Legislature, the bill we are celebrating today, which designates the South Portland Turnpike Approach Road of Samantha Smith Way, I decided to testify in support. Through the connections this has helped me discover, I have seen firsthand the impact Samantha had on our state and the ways in which she has influenced many of my teachers, neighbors, and myself. Her efforts helped lead to better relations between our nation and many others, which inspired children across the country and right here at home. Thank you. There's a feature right there. Cecilia, thank you so much for being here, and you're a, an inspiration to all of us here, just like Samantha was, because really it's all about the young people, and it's all about inspiring a, a generation to work for peace, because I've done some teaching, substitute teaching, and I've come up to the classes and I've said, my generation, the love generation, the generation of the 60s, we're the ones that were supposed to change the world, and on behalf of that generation, I apologize. We have to leave it up to you. So Cecilia, thank you so much. Keep up the great work. 
Uh, next, I'd like to bring up the mayor of South Portland, who's been a big supporter of all this, Mayor Kate Lewis. Can everyone hear me? Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here um, this morning for such a special dedication. Um, I want to thank Veterans for Peace, and particularly you, Don, for just incredible work over so many years and all of the, the diligence and forethought that went into creating um, the ceremony this day and Senator Carney for shepherding. Um, that bill through the legislature. I also just want to recognize um, two city councilors that, that are here with us today, Councilor Natalie West, who's an at-large councilor representing the whole city, and Councilor um, and recent mayor, Deca Dalak, who represents District 5, where we are sitting today. So what an inspiration Samantha Smith is for all of us, and particularly related to the power of good and clear and thought out and heartfelt communication. I think it's a privilege to be able to honor her legacy right here in South Portland by dedicating this busy route to her. So in the city of South Portland, we have 26,000 plus people who live here, but the population within the city bounds at any given time swells to approximately 100,000 during the day because of all of the activity, commercial, educational, um, economic activity here in South Portland and just driving into uh, the Best Western Man Mary Manor Inn this morning, you can see the hundreds or thousands of vehicles that will use this route daily. And what a powerful message to convey to people who may not know what this young woman did, who may not know the history, who might have a spark of interest and wonder why um, we've put some energy into dedicating this roadway to her. I think it's important that just by sheer visibility alone that this message continues. I think there's a lot that we can say about the power of good communication towards peace, towards building global community, particularly in an era when we are considered to be all well connected by our devices. I didn't bring mine up here, but I have, you know, we all have a watch. Some of us have a watch on. Many of us have a computer in our pockets, et cetera. Um, but the power of good communication doesn't get relayed through emojis or reposting something. It gets relayed through actual conversations, actual written correspondence, actual face-to-face -face visits and meetings. And what a powerful legacy that Samantha Smith leaves to us to carry on in this day and age when we need it most. So thank you for um, being here and for recognizing her right here in our city of South Portland. Thank you, Mayor Kate. Great to have a mayor who believes as we at Veterans for Peace do Keep up the great work. We know you've got plenty of challenges here in, in South Portland, so we appreciate you uh, being behind this project and, and uh, being up here. Our next speaker before we bring on our entertainment is Robert Shetterly. Robert is, the, is a VFP honorary member. He's an author, he's an activist, and an artist. Uh, originally from Ohio, uh, graduated from Harvard with a degree in English literature, but that wasn't good enough. He decided to go on and start painting Americans who tell the truth, and I believe Bob will tell you about, Rob will tell you about how he did that. Right now he's painted more than 225 portraits just like this. His first was uh, Walt Whitman, and an incredible uh, body of, of work. And, and over, uh, I believe, what uh, f about five years ago, Bob started uh, Americans Who Tell the Truth. And as part of that, he runs the Samantha Smith Challenge, which uh, they just had on the 24th of last month. And ladies and gentlemen, I give you Rob, Rob Shetterly. Uh, thank you. Wonderful to be here. And uh, just a little 
hats off to obsessive compulsive disorder. There are actually 270 paintings now. I can't <laughs> seem to stop this thing. But um, we did just, uh, I think it's the eighth year of the Samantha Smith Challenge, which is, is active in middle schools around the state, challenging young kids like Cecilia to become uh, more deeply engaged, not just about peace, but about all the issues that are so important to young people today. I want to um, actually go off in a quite a different direction. Um, I knew that there would be a lot of people telling the story of Samantha here, so I wanted to come at it a different way. And so I'm going to um, uh, more or less read uh, something I wrote about her and about what she represents, um, and it won't it won't take too long. <clears throat> One of the great adventures in literature, religion, and myth is that of the hero's journey. A person in fairy tales is usually a young prince, but really anyone, young or old, ma male or female, LGBTQ, or of any race or ethnicity, sets out on a quest. The quest may be to rescue someone in distress, slay a dragon, discover the truth, right an injustice, or just confront one's fear. It may also be a quest for identity, the testing of metal that teaches us who we can be if we don't give up. In the process, the quest for justice and identity becomes a morality tale, a tale of inspiration. As obstacles are overcome and courage not previously known is discovered, the person on the journey becomes a hero, a model for all of our journeys. The world of Americans who tell the truth uh, in the world of Americans Who Tell the Truth, most of the portrait subjects can certainly be said to have completed a hero's journey. Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Mother Jones, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr., Alice Paul, um, Rachel Carson, Eugene Debs, Daniel Ellsberg, Fannie Lou Hamer. These luminary lives did and do inspire millions of others. However, in Americans Who Tell the Truth, we find a surprising number of girls who have embarked on such journeys and who ultimately have become guides and teachers for adults. As I was thinking recently about some of these young women, like Samantha Smith, Claudette Colvin, Barbara Johns, Jason Hunter Mellers, and Jess Kelsey Juliana, it occurred to me how similar they are to Dorothy of The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz opens in panic as a terrifying tornado bears down on a small, gray, desolate Kansas farm of Dorothy, Aunt Em, and Uncle Henry. The adults yell for Dorothy to run to the storm cellar, but Dorothy refuses until she can find her beloved dog, Toto, who is hiding somewhere in the house. Dorothy and Toto, uh, the, too late, the tornado picks up the house, Dorothy and Toto, and carries them to the imaginary realm of Oz. The more I thought about the, that moment in the story, the more it seemed obvious that L. Frank Baum, the author, created that incident not merely to isolate Dorothy and Toto so that they could begin their journey at a, in, an, in an eccentric magic realm, but to show us how acts of radical compassion, like Dorothy's to risk herself to save the dog she loves, transport us into another realm of human experience, a qualitatively higher realm where Dorothy begins her hero's journey. Notice, by the way, that neither Auntie M nor Uncle Henry risk leaving the safety of the storm cellar to try to save Dorothy from the tornado. Notice, too, if Dorothy had chosen to save herself and not Toto, we'd have no story. The tornado would have whirled, whirled the house, whirled the, away the house, and it certainly wouldn't have landed on the Wicked Witch of the East. The risk of radical compassion creates the journey, and it writes the story. Along the yellow brick road, I mean, you know all the story, but I need to retell it, tell it just a little bit. Along the yellow brick road, Dorothy meets and befriends the scarecrow, the tin woodman, the cowardly lion, who all decide to travel with her to Oz to petition the great wizard to give them a brain for the scarecrow, a heart for the tin woodman, and some courage for the lion and a return trip to Kansas for Dorothy. Now we have a quadruple journey based on mutual help and friendship. Multiple scary trials confront them, and as they defeat each evil threat, 
we discover what our heroes have not yet understood. The scarecrow is very smart, the tin woman, woodwind has an indomitable heart, and the lion is always able to triumph over trepidation and find his courage. The trials of the quest are teaching them that the virtues they thought existed outside of them are in fact inside, ready to be discovered. As Frank Baum says, they needed to be taken apart and put back together. But the crucial factor here, as it relates to Americans who tell the truth, is that it took the leadership of a child, the girl Dorothy, to show her adult traveling companions how to access their intelligence, their compassion, and their courage. She becomes their teacher, their moral compass, just as Samantha did for many adults during the Cold War. And that Colvin and Barbara Johns did for adult willingness to confront segregation. Claudette said, as a teenager, I kept thinking, why don't the adults around here just say something? Say it so that we know, we, they know we don't accept segregation. I knew then and I know now that when it comes to justice, there is no easy way to get it. You can't sugarcoat it. You have to take a stand and say, this is not right, and I did. Dorothy, following her quest to find it, to find a way out of this imaginary world and back to the reality of Kansas, inadvertently learns how powerful she is as she defeats two, witch, two evil witches. But Oz is not so much an imaginary <coughs> world as a hyper-reality, a testing ground where good and evil forces clash and real character is forged. As her companions are each attaining the virtue they yearn for, Dor Dorothy has found her brains, her heart, and her courage. Back in Kansas, she is thrilled to be home, but the hierarchy of relationship will forever be changed, all because she chose compassion over safety. That decision, like Samantha's to write her letter and travel to the Soviet Union, like Claudette's to refuse to move on a bus, like Barbara's to lead a school walkout, set a trajectory for real change because they insisted adults live up to adult responsibilities. As citizens of a democracy, we are constantly reminded that voting is the means of social change. But we often cannot vote for the change we most need. It's the courage and clarity of kids who can't yet vote that can motivate a society to embrace its moral responsibilities. Dorothy completed her task. Samantha's journey for peace is not yet done because ours isn't. She is still our guide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. That was really inspiring. I uh, wanted to recognize uh, somebody else that Rob has also painted, one of his 200 and Seven, 270, 270 portraits that he has mentioned. Uh, one of those folks is in the room right now. I'd like to recognize former mayor of South Portland, Daka, who Rob painted, and she was also an inspiration uh, for getting this project done when she, when she was mayor. So welcome, and thank you. We're honored that you're here with us. Okay, next is our entertainment for the day, Madeline Mayo, and while she's uh, setting up, I'll just tell you a little bit about her. <coughs> Madeline comes to us from North Yarmouth Academy, where she's attending school there, and she was just recently uh, on the front page of the Century of the May 19th edition. Uh, she just turned 13 on Saturday, so happy birthday, Madeline. <laughs> uh, officially a teenager. And she was uh, very honored to be accepted to the Interlochen Arts Camp in Interlochen, uh, Michigan, which I had never heard of because I'm not very cultured, I'm afraid. And so that is a great honor. I saw her picture on the paper, and uh, Maxine Ryder from the Century. Maxine, are you here today? I 
guess not. Uh, he did he did a front page story on her, and he also did the front page story on this uh, event. If you folks haven't seen it yet, uh, really really nice of him to do that. Um, so anyway, Madeline is going to play Concerto in A Minor, Opus Three, Number Six, First Movement by Vivaldi. Ladies and gentlemen, Madeline Mayo.
there's the future right there. Two 13 year olds that really inspire us, huh? Okay, well, next we want to bring up somebody who actually taught at Manchester Elementary School way back in the day when Samantha Smith attended the school. I'd like to bring up next Suzanne Hendrick, longtime peace activist and a former teacher. Welcome, please help us welcome Suzanne. I've been in South Portland since 8.30 this morning. I know every street out there, but I couldn't find this place. <laughs> Not only did I teach at the Manchester School, I was a token communist there. Tom Sturdivant was the token communist at Coney High School. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I was looking to think of calendar. The same year that Samantha wrote the letter and went to the Soviet Union, millions of us were in, was in New York City uh, asking for an end to nuclear threats, uh, and uh, over a million people gathered their anti-nuclear crowd. That was in 1982. In 1984, I wish Jane were here, uh, we had a peace march in, in Augusta that was a uh, freeze walk. There was a, a contingent of TV uh, cameras at the Civic Center. There was an election year of some, so we thought we'd take advantage of it, Tom Sturdivant and I. And Samantha and her mother and dad joined us in this wonderful walk in Augusta. And one of the prizes I gave was uh, I had a zucchini garden, so I designed this bomb, and I said, let's drop zucchinis instead of bombs. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Samantha was a real inspiration, and uh, my son was born two, two months after she was. And oh, by the way, if you see these cranes on the table, these, I'm sure, Samantha must have read Sadako's book of the 1,000 paper cranes. This little girl who survived the Hiroshima bombing but eventually died of the uh, illness of that. And so there are some cranes, I'm sorry there aren't enough for everybody, but they were donated by Bob uh, Chisholm, Lee Chisholm, uh, whose wife had made the hundreds of them uh, in, in order to survive cancer treatment. And we used them for the Dr. Lown ceremony last year. If you know Dr. Lown, who was a founder of Physicians with Social Responsibility. So a month after Samantha died, I wrote this, and it was published in the church world. Today on the rocks in Pemaquid, I met a student from Israel and another from Norway visiting with the main family building a portion of that elusive bridge for peace. A bumper sticker that has often caught my eye says, think globally, act locally. Samantha Smith, as a child of 10, did just that. Concerned that the world in which she lived might be destroyed in a nuclear war, she wrote a letter that forever changed her life and that of her family. Today, Samantha is gone. Now it is up to us, the living, to build the world of peace that Sam dreamed of. No child of 10 should ever have felt compelled to take on the monumental task of saving mankind. But we are faced with the disturbing fact that countless brilliant scientific minds choose to further their careers by fashioning abhorrent weapons of ultimate destruction to further man's ill will rather than to cure the ills of mankind. As Samantha did, we must think globally and act locally. Maine, a big state with a small population, is also a part of the globe. Samantha brought a global attention to bear on the tiny town of Manchester, Maine. 
let us hold that attention and build in our own state of Maine a global museum of peace in honor of a special Maine child. Let the museum house with Jane Smith's permission the many gifts showered upon Samantha by the Soviet Union and other mementos of Samantha's brief journey for peace. Let it also be a center for global studies where children and adults from around the world can come together in, harmo in harmony to start to build a better, safer, more harmonious world, a place where we can learn to resolve those bitter conflicts that turn nation against nation, brother against brother. With the <clears throat> pennies from children big and small from around the world, let us build a sanctuary for children from Northern Ireland, South Africa, Lebanon, Cuba, Israel, Russia, the Middle East, Nicaragua, and from all troubled centers of the globe. Let them come swim in our lakes, run in our fields, climb our hills, pick our blueberries, milk our cows, catch our lobsters, sing, dance, play, and work together. A place where they can learn that we are one earth, one family, with many different voices, many different faces, many different songs and dances, but one common dream of peace. Impossible? Perhaps. I think not. Not long ago, a woman who had visited Hiroshima had a dream. She dreamt of a peace ribbon, a small ribbon to tie around the Pentagon. But in a matter of months, the ribbon grew into 35,000 segments from all <coughs> over the world, stretching 15 miles to encompass the Pentagon, the Lincoln Memorial, and our nation's capital. A child had a dream, a global dream. Let us not abandon Samantha's dream. No child of 10 should ever again feel compelled to take on the monumental task of saving mankind. Together, we can make it possible. Now, there was a school in outside of Waterville named the Oak Grove Coburn School. It was a Quaker school and it ran out of funding and it, was, it had to close. And I thought, I have a dream for that school. So I wrote Jean Meyer, president of Tufts University at the time, and asked if we couldn't possibly turn that school into a diplomatic school for young people. And he responded to me, I have his response someplace here. But it didn't come possible, but I could just vision that beautiful school, which is now the main police academy. <laughs> Thank you. Once again, Suzanne Hendrick. They don't make teachers like her anymore. Thank you, Suzanne, that was wonderful. Next, I'd like to bring up Robert Kelly. I hope he's here, I think I, I see him standing in the back there. Robert, come on, come on down. Robert's an assistant professor at the School of International Service, American University, and he specializes in the study of global citizenship, the exercise of civic responsibility on a global level. He's a former State Department official, currently working on a book on Samantha and an online newsletter he writes called Dispatches from Samantha Land. Welcome, Robert. That's okay. I've also got some um, uh, genetic projection. Uh, so if you can't hear me in the back, I can raise my voice. Um, I have to just come back to something Miss Hendrick uh, had to say. Um, it reminds me of a funny story of when Samantha arrived at Manchester Elementary School. She arrived there in the third grade. She moved from Holton. And uh, when she got down to Manchester and entered, uh, she didn't know anybody. Um, you know, it, it was, you know, she's a new student. Um, but in the third grade, she had a teacher named Miss Kelleher. I don't know if that name rings a bell, Miss Hendrick. Um, but um, 
she noticed one day that the students weren't being very kind to Miss Kelleher. And this just gives you an inkling of what Samantha was capable of. Um, she actually took the time to write Miss Kelleher a letter apologizing on behalf of the other students for her treatment, um, for the treatment of her that day, saying, you know, these students didn't treat you very politely, but I take you seriously. And she spelled serious, S-E-A-R-O-U-S, you know, in the third grade. Um, but she wrote this beautiful letter, and it was just um, an illustration of what uh, Samantha believed, and that is, you know, one is that people should be treated with respect, especially your teachers. And, and secondly, the power of communicating through the written word. She wasn't the sort of person to stand up and speak extemporaneously at that age, of course, but she drew immense power from the written word, and she did this uh, for Miss Kelleher that day. Um, so that reminds me of um, how much she respected her teachers in Manchester. Um, uh, I, um, just to kind of add a little bit to my story here, uh, I grew up in the next town over from Samantha. I grew up in East Winthrop. And, um, and so I got to see a lot of this story unfold, not from the first row, but from the second row. I like to think of it that way. But it inspired me all the same. I consider myself a contemporary of Samantha's. Uh, wish I had had a chance to meet her, but never did. Our social circles inter intersected in lots of places, but it never came to came to pass. She was two years older than me, and that's um, a lot of time when you're uh, nine, ten years old, um, as you know. So um, that certainly inspired me. Today, I am a historian, and um, I study cultural diplomacy, and it's in no small part um, owing to Samantha's inspiration when um, when I was a kid, you know, really exposed me to the, the wider world and told me that there's a lot out there beyond um, Kennebec County. I want to say thank you to everybody who played a part, Don, um, Senator Carney, uh, in, in, in making this day possible. It, 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 when I hear how this came together, it, it, it makes me kind of chuckle inside because it sounds so easy. You know, like everybody was kind of on the same page and it passed, you know, uh, unanimously and the sign is there and everything is done. And, um, you know, but imagine this, imagine uh, that, um, that a, a time when attempts to put Samantha's name on something um, is, is really not that easy. <laughs> and um, just to give you a quick example, not long after she passed away, um, there was an attempt to put her name on a bridge. And I don't know if anybody remembers this, but this bridge happens to run between Bangor and Brewer. And uh, at the time, there was, uh, in the public discourse, um, a real debate over whether or not to name that bridge after Samantha Smith, a peace bridge, or to name it after our veterans. So in effect, it actually, in the public's discourse, put our veterans in competition with Samantha Smith. And I think that there's a lot of poetic justice in the fact that Veterans for Peace have come back today to get behind Samantha Smith and hold her name up. Um, so just a, a, a couple more things that I'll say. Um, I, I think that there's more to this than just putting her name on something, obviously. And I really do hope that today we come out of this um, with the, the courage and the initiative to keep telling her story. That's what I do. I am deeply concerned. Um, as a historian, I, I deal with narrative and I deal with memory. And I can tell you that after 40 years of, of having lived, you know, um, Samantha a long time ago, her, her, her narrative and her memory are very much in, in, in a precious state. So um, the more that all of us can do to keep telling her story, to keep remembering her and to pass on her lessons, this is the ultimate tribute to her life, is, is to keep passing it on. People like Rob Shetterly, um, you know, with the Samantha Smith Challenge, making sure that this is talked about in schools. You know, this, this is um, really vital, vital work. So keep telling her story. Keep passing along her lessons. Don't let them pass away. You know, I, I wanna just close with this one other story. There are two schools in the United States 
named after Samantha Smith. Neither of them are in Maine, incidentally. One of them is in, uh, is in Queens, New York, and the other one is in Seattle, outside of Seattle, the town of Sammamish, you know, so that there was a, a certain connection there. Um, I contacted the principal of that school in Seattle, and I said, how do you remember her? And she said, well, every year we do something for her. When they chose to name her school, that school after her, they chose her over Amelia Earhart. Yeah. <laughs> That was that talk about competition. So they, they named her school, they named their school after Samantha. And they and they remember her every year, the students. They know her story. I contacted the principal at Queens, and even though they've named the school after Samantha, I, I asked the principal, so how do you remember her? And I and he said, I'm sorry, I d I don't really know her story. Didn't she have something to do with peace? This is the principal of the school. So it takes a bit more than just the name. We have a responsibility coming out of an event like today, an occasion like today, to keep telling her story. And please, on behalf of the people um, who are really, really pushing this story, and to see her name in more places, tell her story, go see her statue, go see whatever it is that's out there that reminds you of the importance of her life, the impact that she had on this planet when she was on this planet. And, um, and that is all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah. That's Rob, Robert Kelly, Assistant Professor at the School of International Service, American University. Uh, Robert, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Really appreciate it. I would be, I would be remiss, and thank you, Senator Carney, for reminding me to recognize uh, our representative from this area of city, right next to Mayor Daca, is Lois Reckett. Lois, uh, could you just stand and be recognized? Thank you so much for, for being here today, supporting, supporting this. Okay, next I'd like to bring up Gary Lawless. Gary's gonna read a poem for us. Gary's the owner of Gulf of Maine Books in Brunswick, Maine. Gary. So uh, my friend Suzanne emailed me and asked me to write a poem for this event. And at first I was a little reluctant <clears throat> because the last time I dealt with the DOT, <laughs> they were taking me to jail for being, arrest, uh, for being uh, chained to a tree in Warren, um, <laughs> trying to protect my tree brothers and sisters who were being called fixed deadly objects instead of trees. So anyway, I'm here, not, <laughs> I'm here for Samantha. So this is a poem um, for Samantha Smith Day. A young voice asks, why are people afraid of each other? A young voice asks, will there be a war? A young voice asks if tomorrow will be the last day. A young voice wonders if we will find the way to world peace. A young voice says, we do not have enemies. We only have friends we have not met yet. We drive into the heart of Maine. We drive into the future knowing each of us is important. Each of us can make a difference. Each of us has a voice and can change the world. We are not alone. Love is everywhere. Peace is possible. May we travel the path with heart. May we travel the road to peace. May we all travel the Samantha Smith way. Thank you, Gary. Yes, let's all, we'll, we'll all be traveling the Samantha Smith Way here in just uh, about another hour or so when we do the unveiling. Thank you so much, Gary. And Gary does have Lena Nelson's book over there, and uh, make sure you get
get a copy of that. Um, and uh, Robert uh, Kelly, you, we didn't find out when uh, your book's going to be coming out on Samantha. Oh, it's going to be a while. Okay. I've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Robert's going to write a book, so stay tuned for that also. Next, I'd like to bring up uh, another member of the main chapter of Veterans for Peace. And if you haven't figured it out now, we have just an outstanding membership uh, in this chapter. I'm so very proud to be part of, of the main Veterans for Peace. We're going to bring up here in just a moment uh, Dud Hendricks. But uh, before we do, I've got I to tell you a little bit about Dud. And it's going to take me a while because he's such an outstanding uh, individual. Uh, Dud uh, was awarded the Hands of Peace Award presented by the Eastern Ming Peace and Justice in September of 2010. He is a Vietnam veteran. He also was the men's lacrosse coach at Dartmouth College where an award has been endowed honoring his contributions. He was a captain in the United States Air Force. He's an adjunct professor of peace studies. He was an adjunct professor at peace studies at the University of Maine. Uh, also is the director and founder of the Cardigan Mountain Lacrosse Camp, a boys athletic camp with a special concentration on sportsmanship and character issues. Today all just, also just happens to be Dud's 60th anniversary of his graduation from the class of Annapolis. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dud Hendricks. Thank you, Don. I'm fearful that, uh, that you're going to leave here with the misunderstanding that uh, Suzanne Hedrick is my mom or a relative of mine, <laughs> unless you go away with that and harm, that lest any uh, harm be done to her reputation. Uh, we are just dear friends, I believe, and beloved friends, and so I'm proud to be one of her associates in Veterans for Peace. When asked if I was interested in saying a few words today, I immediately began thinking, if ever there were a time to celebrate Samantha, most assuredly it is now. As I reflected on our history, I concluded that there really has never been a time in my lifetime that it has not been a time for Samantha Smith. For her counsel, for her call for communication in our government's conduct and in international affairs. Samantha was perplexed, as we know, by all the saber rattling, the demonization of the other, the failure to simply sit down and talk. She wrote at one time, if we could be friends by just getting to know one another, why can't our countries get along as well? As I prepared these remarks, a relevant coincidence occurred to me that Don just disclosed. Yeah, I'm a Naval Academy graduate 60 years ago today this morning. I hope at this point you're all thinking, geez, he can't be that old. <laughs> On that day, LBJ, then the Vice President, told us new ensigns and second lieutenants, America does not strive to avoid war because we fear it, but because we hate it. We do not strive for peace, because we are weak, but because we are strong. And so the 876 of us headed out full of patriotic fervor, thinking we'd be serving mankind through our military service. This country's track record, the one I've known ever since to include scores of military invasions on foreign lands has eroded the idealism and the zeal persuading me to drop the rose-tinted glasses and to acknowledge unvarnished truths. You might accuse me of being woke, a bit of a loaded expression these days. We must know our history and we must cease the othering. We are not worth more, they are not worth less. I believe that Samantha would subscribe to those sentiments. My sentiments are now governed by another president, Dwight Eisenhower, whose warning 10 years earlier, before I graduated from the academy, are today and then were inarguably prescient. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who, are hung who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. The world in arms is not spending money alone, it is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, and the hopes of its children. 
This could well have been Samantha's mantra. Its truth, I would submit, was foundational for her anxiety and for her call for knowing the other. Let me share with you quickly a few truths that I know now that much of the world knows of us. We have 800 military bases around the world, many, many more than the rest of the world combined. And we have a military budget representing 39% of all the rest of the country's military budgets combined, greater than the next 11 largest military budgets. Our military interventions since 9-11 have cost American taxpayers some $3 trillion and, of course, millions of lives. The U.S. military is the single largest contributor to global warming and, the and to the degradation of our environment. If ever there were a time to honor Samantha Smith. So where do we find hope? It's important that I share a disclosure at this point. I'm a former board member of Rob Shetterly's Americans Who Tell the Truth, a, board, a proud, very proud former board member. So acknowledging that possible bias, I'd still declare that the project, especially the Samantha Smith challenge to carry the seed that could save us and the planet. In large part, this initiative has been a two-person effort. Rob and Connie Carter, his colleague and the project's education director. So now each year for the past eight years, Rob has brought to the children of this state, across the state, Samantha's message. I'm a firm believer that Samantha's way is the only way. Without knowing the other, we will never know peace. So unfortunately, Don did forget one thing today. I was anticipating that we would have champagne around, but I'd like you to join me nevertheless in, in uh, a hear here for Samantha Smith in the hope that her voice may be heard around the world and may yet save our planet. Hear, hear. Hear, hear. Hear, hear. Thank you. Doug Hendricks, Veteran for Peace. Thank you, Doug. And I'd like to bring up our final speaker, who I'm very proud to present, Doug Rollins. He is the chair our pre well, he likes to be referred to as El Presidente of our of our Veterans for Peace chapter. Doug is a Vietnam veteran. He's been an educator for over 40 years. And recently, Doug was given Veterans for Peace's national award, the highest award that can be given, the Howard Zinn Lifetime Achievement Award. Doug Rollins. Well, I'm proud to announce that I've uh, reviewed these remarks, and I will take no longer than five minutes of your time. So uh, I'd also like to, before I begin, uh, acknowledge the fact that we are the Tom Sturdivant chapter of Veterans for Peace, named after Tom Sturdivant. And Suzanne Sturdivant is here with us today, his daughter. Uh, thank you, and we have, a, we have a tradition in Veterans for Peace, by the way, uh, when we have our conventions, uh, is to recognize those in our, our organization who have died, passed away, and stuff like that. And we read their names, and then we go, presente. So I'd like to do that with Samantha Smith. Samantha Smith, presente. presente. Samantha Smith, presente. presente. Samantha Smith, presente. presente. She's still with us. Okay, now I'll get to the five minutes, I think. Um, it's truly an honor to be with you today as we join in recognizing the power of one person's voice in the world that we all share together. When Samantha Smith wrote her famous letter to Yuri Andrabov, she was younger than my youngest granddaughter is today. When I look at this accomplishment from the perspective of a grandfather, I'm truly awestruck and then profoundly hopeful. Samantha Smith's example of truly reaching out to another person whose life is far different from hers provides us all, regardless of our ages, with a guiding light. We do not have to sit passively by as some of our so-called leaders manipulate our lives through their narrow, self-centered agendas. If we follow Samantha Smith's light, we can engage in meaningful discussions, just like this young Russian poet, Julia Junina, did as she wrote this tribute in 1985 to Samantha Smith. Quote, Samantha, you are like a little star flashing over the planet, on the sky covered with dark clouds under the stare of kind and evil eyes. 
You believe that it was still not too late to save the earth. Today, we stretch our arms out to all your friends, Samantha." End quote. Now in 2023, I'd like to pay my tribute to Samantha Smith from the perspective of a veteran for peace. By the way, we formed, there are five of us that formed this organization in 1985 here in Maine. Uh, and we now have NGO status at the United Nations. We have about 130 chapters across the nation, six international chapters, um, including a chapter in Russia, which I will address in a moment. Uh, our organization was officially created on July 8, 1985, in Auburn, Maine, a mere month before Samantha and her father met their tragic deaths in the same town. I truly believe that Samantha Smith's indomitable spirit lives on through our organization as a guiding light. We have committed ourselves to abolishing war on this planet for the sake of our children and grandchildren. In that spirit, and following Samantha Smith's unwavering light, our main chapter of Veterans for Peace formed a sister chapter agreement with a chapter of Russian veterans living in the Komi Republic. Many of their members are veterans of their government's war with Afghanistan what many Vietnam veterans can consider to be a comparable experience to ours. The main chapter of Veterans for Peace and the Comey Russian chapter of Veterans for Peace signed this statement of solidarity in April 2019. In the spirit of world peace, with great respect for each other's efforts to forge a working relationship of nonviolence, we veterans of two of the world's armies declare the following. As citizens of our respective countries, we will no longer bear arms against each other, nor will we support either government's attempts to militarize diplomacy between our two great countries. As veterans of the United States and Russian military forces, we hereby forswear any attempts to revise historical accounts that glorify war. We will step forward to set the record straight when necessary. As citizens of the world and as veterans, we will actively pursue peaceful means to reconcile any differences that arise between our two countries. In that spirit, we will engage in dialogue with our respective government officials to reduce and eliminate animosities when they arise. As veterans and as citizens, we will actively work to propose and support all cultural exchanges that will illustrate the true costs of war and the true benefits of peaceful coexistence. We will use our status as military veterans to convince our fellow citizens, our government's ambassadors, and our fellow veterans that it is in the best interest of our children and grandchildren to pursue these goals. We hereby declare that we will work in the best interest of Veterans for Peace, in the best interest of, uh, of our two countries' citizens and veterans, and in the best interest of our own families and loved ones to bring peace into the world. In that spirit, we forge this relationship between our two organizations signed by myself and signed by Alexander Rosakin of the Komi Republic. Dear Samantha, please know that your spirit lives on through those of us who found inspiration from your words and your commitment to peace. And thank you to all of you gathered here today to work as citizens of the world to bring peace to this planet as we follow Samantha Smith's lead. May we go in peace. Ben Rollins, president of the main chapter of Veterans for Peace and a co-founder of Veterans for Peace National. Thank you, Doug, for those words. Well, ladies and gentlemen, oh, we're not supposed to say that anymore. Well, anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry? I, I don't know who you are. The Samantha Smith chapter of Veterans for Peace. Come on up. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a representative from the Samantha Smith chapter of Veterans for Peace, and he's going to say a few words to us. We, we just met uh, a, a few minutes ago, and I'm presenting John Shushard. John Shushard. All right, John, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks so much for your generosity uh, in allowing me to speak. But uh, I want to bring a presente to Paul Brailsford, who uh, named our chapter, and he had gone to Russia, I think this is an important part of the story, with Maine Veterans for Peace. Uh, and so he knew about Samantha Smith. Uh, nobody in America <laughs> really knew. Uh, and he said, we are going to name our chapter uh, for Samantha Smith, and so we have, we have done that. Paul was a survivor, he was a supply ship at Okinawa, survived the kamikaze attack, he was a heavy combat 
merchant marine captain, uh, and when he turned his heart to peace, he turned his whole life to peace. And uh, so he and Samantha Smith have a bond in eternity. And the other thing I wanted to mention on the, and I think so important for us, uh, on hope and uh, the path not taken was President John F. Kennedy's speech at American University on June 10th, 60 years ago. And uh, mass peace action, I know, is uh, making sure that uh, towns and cities and schools are listening and it's available as a, uh, you know, as a film. You can hear the voice of this other uh, extreme uh, heavy combat veteran survivor, uh, John Kennedy, as he pleads and intends to turn this, uh, this country towards disarmament. It's a speech that resonates with Dr. King, with Gandhi, uh, with all of the Americans who have speak, spoken for peace, and it's a path we can still take. So if you haven't heard that June 10th speech at American University, uh, I, I urge you to, uh, to access it and uh, provide forums for it to be heard. Uh, so Martin Ray and I are here from Samantha Smith Chapter of the North Shore of Boston, and we're, I can't tell you what a thrill it is to hear each of you and to draw this one. Oh, uh, I have to mention that uh, with Bruce Gagnon uh, of Keep Space for Peace up in Bath and Brunswick, uh, we went to Russia in uh, 2019, and we went to uh, Camp Artek, and uh, uh, where uh, Samantha Smith uh, was, and they welcomed us. And they had a whole display case of her photographs, her letters. Uh, they named in Russia. They've named a rose after Samantha Smith. They've named a mountain after Samantha Smith. They have a Samantha Smith uh, postage stamp, uh, and this speech of President Kennedy. Uh, was uh, ordered by Khrushchev to be played on the radio by, in translation and published in every newspaper of the Soviet Union at that time. So the impulse for peace and the abhorrence of war is so enormous in Russia. Be assured this is a people, a peace-loving people, abhorring war, and uh, Khrushchev and Kennedy uh, shared that passion <laughs> And we are trying to reignite that, that, uh, that path, open that path. Uh, so we, we saw the bed that Samantha Smith slept in, uh, the room where she was there with all her colleague, uh, young uh, Russian women, and uh, it, it was, uh, it was a, a thrilling moment, Camp Artek on the Crimea. So thank you so much. Thank you, John. That was really nice. And it's the Samantha Smith chapter down on the North Shore of Massachusetts, where I hail from Manchester by the sea. So perhaps I can get an honorary honorary membership. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> well, again, thank you, everybody here for for coming uh, to this. I, I think it's been a wonderful uh, celebration of Samantha Smith's life and her legacy. Uh, let's all continue on to work for peace because, as you heard very, uh, a lot of the speakers say, you know, we're very close now to nuclear war, closer now than we ever were uh, since 1962. And it's going to take all of us to get out there and bring some sanity to the situation right now because, you know, a lot's changed since Samantha left us. And, and by the way, I would be remiss in. in not saying that when Samantha died in 1985, she died in a plane crash in Lewiston, along with her father, Arthur. Her mother, Jane, was not on the flight. Jane's still living up in Booth Bay Harbor. She was invited tonight, uh, this morning, uh, but she couldn't make it, but she wanted to send uh, her best uh, wishes to everybody here, and uh, she's very appreciative of our celebration of her daughter's life and of uh, having Samantha Smith away. One thing that has changed is I don't know if most people realize or not, because you know the press doesn't talk about this, and the and the federal government doesn't talk about this. But nuclear weapons are illegal. They're illegal. They've become they've been, they've been illegal since January of 2022. And I'm holding here the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons signed by the United Nations. Now the nine countries that possess nuclear weapons, none of them have signed this. So this is something that folks have really been working on, trying to get uh, local municipalities, uh, state officials, county, and then finally federal officials to 
sign on and make nuclear weapons a thing of the past. We can do it. So anyway, we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, you know, I just want to close with the Beatles. Maybe their their last album. The last thing that they ever sang about was, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Let's make a lot of love. Thank you very much. And we're going to take a little bit of a break, and then we're all going to gather over by the exit over there. Uh, but those of who want to, we're going to go over and dedicate um, Samantha Smith Way. Uh, we are supposed to get some direction from the South Portland Police Department. We will have two of our members of Veterans for Peace wearing fluorescent vests. We want to be very, very careful getting over there and back. Uh, we don't want anybody crossing individually. We're all going to go over as a group and come back as a group. Please be very careful because that intersection is just really dangerous. And the sign is just across the street. I don't know if, if, if those of you have seen it yet or not and the Department of Transportation will do an unveiling. So let's take uh, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll head on over. We'll go out the exit door. Thank you so very much, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good speech. Yeah, good